Don't you all bring a Bible with you today? Let's open our Bibles together to the uh, book of Psalm. No, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 10. Of course, we want to welcome all of you that may be watching online. Um, we just took some time there to pray and spend some time together. And so hope you did the same thing. And uh, we're delighted you can be with us tonight. Praise God. So get your Bible and we'll have a, uh, a good study in the Word of God and uh, be blessed by it. Amen. Proverbs chapter 10. If you can find that opening in your Bible. Proverbs chapter 10. Hallelujah. How many of you uh, had a good day today? How many are you going to have a better one tomorrow? Amen. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes you ask people, you know, how was your day? They'll say, well, I've had better. And, uh, you know, that, that can happen sometimes, you know, depending on what it is that we're dealing with. You know, <clears throat> um, that's just part of, the, that's part of life. Amen. What's that song that used, they used to sing? Uh, I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden. Or Was that what that was? I don't even know who's, I don't know anything about that. But anyway, uh, it just came up. Hallelujah. But thank God we know him. Amen. Um, you know, seeing uh, all the things that are going on around us, how many of you know it's kind of chaotic, chaotic, a little, you know, weird and strange and all this. Um, because of that, you know, it, it, it brings to bear upon our lives how much more important it is for us to walk in the light and think in line with God's Word. Amen? I mean, if you ever wanted to hold the Word dear to you, close to you, in your thinking, in your mind, I can't think uh, of it being any more important than it is right now. Can you say amen? And, and the reason is, is because we need to rely upon His promises. I think about people like uh, the three Hebrews that got thrown into the fire and, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it was a perilous moment for them in their lives. And yet they, you know, embraced the promise that God had made to them. They said, our God will deliver us. And even if he doesn't, isn't that cool? I mean, God's going to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we ain't bound down to no idol. Hallelujah. You know, so it got hot in the kitchen. Uh, no pun intended. But the reality is, is that they were kept, they were preserved, and, and actually they escaped. And I mean, there was great glory that came out of that, you know, as far as the kingdom of heaven is concerned. And I believe with all my heart, the same thing's true for all of us. Yes, even though we live in this world, we're not of this world. But it is imperative for us as believers, again, to make sure that we're not only walking in the light, but thinking in line with what God's Word says and what it promises. And, you know, I make this statement to you, but it, it really is true. There is no need for concern. You say, well, I don't know what dream world you're living in. Well, the Bible says, I think, 365 times to fear not. Okay? And there's a scripture in the book of Isaiah that, again, he says, fear not, I'm with you. He said, I'll uphold you, I'll keep you, I'll sustain you, I'll help you. I'll uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. That's what God promised. So irrespective of economics, politics, um, you know, um, uh, culture, I mean, you name it, whatever it is that you want to identify as a problem that's going on within the world, Jesus is still Lord. And everything that he said he would and will do, he's doing. Amen. And so that's important for us as believers to make sure that, you know, again, that we're not living in fear, but <clears throat> there is a need for faith in God and faith in his promise. Amen. So that when all this stuff, we start hearing all this stuff, uh, you know, thank God we can look to him and say, well, that might be going on, but thank God he's going to keep me. Everybody say, he will keep me. He will keep you. Amen. Praise God. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 10, now this is not the scripture. Well, you can look at it since you're there. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 3, this is the uh, English Standard Version. It says, the righteous does not let the, or I'm sorry, the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. There's a whole lot of craving going on right now. By the wicked, with such corrupt uh, greed and, and all of the things that are driven by it. And, and 
these are battles that belong to the Lord. And that's why the church really needs to be at prayer right now. Because God, in five minutes, can change everything. Are you listening to me? I mean, you know, if you look to politicians to fix your deal, you're going to be disappointed. But I tell you this much about it, that a praying church and a church that do know their God shall be strong, and the Bible says will do exploits. So you can look for, once everybody gets done with their summer vacations and all of this, and the, you know, the church family kind of comes back you know, into the sheepfold, you can look for invitations to come and pray. Because we're going we're gonna to ratchet that part of our lives up uh, where this world in which we're living is concerned. Here's another scripture in Proverbs eleven twenty one 21 that I think you'll enjoy. It says, be assured. I, I tell you what, when I read this scripture, I get to read it tomorrow because tomorrow is the 11th. Okay. All right. So here's what it is. Verse 21. Be assured. Everybody say, be assured. In other words, just rest easy here for a moment. Be assured an evil person will not go unpunished. You know, the thing that grieves the heart of the righteous right now is injustice. And that there seems to be no remedy, no, no recompense, no reward, nothing. Listen, this scripture right here, I'm settled. That I, I don't know when. You know, we, we, you know, as human beings, we, it should have happened yesterday, right? But listen, be assured, an evil person will not go unpunished, but the offspring of the righteous will be what? Be what? They'll be delivered. Hallelujah. And then the psalmist, David, made this statement in Psalm 37, 25. He said, I've been young, now I'm old. You know, it's amazing when you get older, I didn't say I was old. When you get older, you see things from a different perspective. You learn a lot. You hear the statement all the time, you know, if I, I wish I knew then what I know now, you know, that whole concept. Well, David is basically saying, I've been young, now I'm old. And yet I have not seen the righteous, what's the word? Forsaken. Nor his seed or descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful. And lends, and his descendants are blessed. Is that what it says? Well, and his children become a blessing. Hallelujah. Amen. I, again, I think this must be the uh, English Standard Version. So, <clears throat> what I thought I would do tonight, I mean, I just had this, you know, little unction, I guess you would call it is, is just take some time this evening just to, to seed our hearts with the Word, with the Bible. You know, and, and uh, with regard to God's divine provision. Because how many of you know he's going to take care of us? And yet we just, our inflation rate, I think last month was 8.5%, something like that, I believe. You know, so it continues to be spiraling um, basically out of control. But again, I want to appeal to you that we have a, he a heavenly father that will care for us. You say, well, how's he going to do that? Well, first, it's going to take some faith on your part. You're going to have to turn your eyes on Jesus, and you're going to have to look to him. And then we're going to have to use some wisdom that he gives to us so that we can navigate through these kinds of waters. Hallelujah. Because I tell you what, praise God, he'll bring you out in grand style if you'll follow him. Amen. Jesus never had a problem with provision in his earthly ministry in, what, in, in any way, shape, or form. And, you know, there's one occasion I'm reminded of, you know, I, I share it often, but, you know, when the disciples had for, forgotten to take bread, he said, I want you to be, Jesus said, I want you to beware, listen, of the doctrine of the Pharisees, that's religion, and the doctrine of Herod, and that's government. All the narratives and things like that that you're hearing, dude, he said, you better beware of those things because they're detrimental if you, you know, go down that road and begin to, you know, embrace or fall prey to, whatever you want to call it. He told these disciples, beware of it, of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Herod. And then he went on, you know, in, in this story, uh, 
they didn't understand what he was saying. They thought, well, you know, he's bummed out because we didn't bring any bread. You know, they're, 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 they're fighting. He said, beware of the leaven or the teaching or the doctrine. And so they, in their mind, leaven, they were thinking about, you know, their provision, things like that. And, and what's interesting about it, you can read it for yourself. I think it's in Mark, the third chapter somewhere. You know, Jesus was, I mean, he was taken back by their response. It was like, Really? You have got to be kidding me. In other words, I'm not talking about what it is that you brought or didn't bring. I'm talking to you about, you know, the doctrines or theologies that can destroy your life. And, you know, so he took them back. He said, you know, when we fed the 5,000, how many baskets did you take up? And they said, well, um, I don't remember now. Was it 7, 12? Seven? Okay. Somebody said seven. We'll take that one. Okay. And, he, and then he said, what about the 4,000? So he, what he's doing is he's, he's, he's bringing them into remembrance of things that had happened in the provision. And he said, how about that? And he said, well, I think we had four, 12, whatever the number was. In other words, there was more than enough. There was leftover from what it is that God... And, and so then he just went on to say, he says... It's, it's basically just said, how, why don't you get it, dude? It doesn't matter. God will take care of you no matter what if you'll just trust him and believe him. Don't worry about these things. Now, we have to be wise and we have to do what, you know, uh, whatever it is, however it is that he leads us and things of that nature. But you get the point, don't you? Hallelujah. And it's important for us to understand that, that there is provision for the child of God. Look at the biblical pattern of the children of Israel when they made their exodus out of Egypt. Such a beautiful story. You know, first of all, you know, God comes to Moses, says, I'm going to make a deliverer out of you. And he said, nah, I don't think so. You got the wrong guy. Uh, send somebody else. He goes, nope, you're the one. How many of you have ever done that before? God choose somebody else. And he goes, nope, you're it. Hallelujah. It's wonderful. I said, it's wonderful. Just obey, praise God. And so anyway, he finally says, okay. And, um, and then God begins to show these people his mighty hand. You remember all of the plagues and everything that took place because, you know, Pharaoh wouldn't let him go. God says, not a problem. We'll get this worked out. And before it was over with, he sent them forth. He just wanted to get them out of their country. He sent them forth with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble among their tribe. That's supernatural. And so on their journey, we see where God supernaturally provides for them. And the whole point to all of this is that God had a land we call the promised land, the land of Canaan, you know, that of Israel as it it exists today, that he said, I'm going to give you this land and everything in it, and you're going to be blessed. God wanted to bless them. God wanted to take them to a land of blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And not only that, but again, you know, in different various ways, he turned the, you know, the uh, bitter water into sweet. He fed them with manna. He did all, I mean, supernatural things in in not just a, a, a small way, but in a magnificent, miraculous kind of way. He's still that same God. He hadn't changed. Hallelujah. So when we are tempted to be afraid, when we're tempted to fear, when we're concerned about this, that, or the other, what we need to do is pause, draw back, and say, now wait a minute, let's look at this in the light of God's Word. Let's look at this in the light of His promise. Let's look at this in the light of the covenant that He has made with me or with you. And then we can maybe judge things a bit differently and not... Now, not everybody's going to do this, you guys. I mean, just like tonight, you know, here we have 30 people maybe or whatever the case might be and, uh, you know, a number of people watching online. Not everybody's going to do this, but you can. Hallelujah. And so that in the moment of crisis or whatever circumstance that there might be, you can have full supply, full provision, full whatever it is that you have need of. How many of you believe that tonight? So as we look in the scriptures here, you know, and see this that he did with the nation of Israel, look at this. This is my text, and that's Proverbs uh, 10 and verse 22. 
10 and verse 22. It says, the blessing of the Lord, hallelujah, makes, it makes us, or it maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. The blessing of the Lord. Everybody say, I'm blessed. Well, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. Now, you know, I went, sometimes people will read a scripture like this, and they'll say, well, that can't possibly be about, you know, the phys- physical needs, the material needs, the, you know, the things that we have in this life. And it must mean that, you know, his blessing makes us rich spiritually. Well, his blessing does make us rich spiritually. But you know what? Thank God I, can, I got this concordance and I can look in the Hebrew, homebrew, whatever you want to call it, and I can find out the definition of the word, and this is the definition of rich. Be wealthy. Okay? In other words, be in a state of having a considerably greater number of possessions or money than is normal in a society. Implying both status and honor, implying status and honor to those that are in that state. It means to gain wealth, become rich. Another way to say it is, is to have a full supply. To have a full supply. In other words, whatever the need is. So I want to make this statement to you, though you know it and you're familiar with it, but let me say it to you again. It's simple but profound. It's the will of God for the child of God to be blessed. Amen. And you're his child. Isn't that right? So praise God every morning when you gain consciousness, you can say, Father, I thank you because I'm blessed. Not on the basis of my livelihood or circumstance or anything of that nature. I'm blessed. Now let's look at a verse of scripture in Psalm, uh, Psalm 1. Again, this, these are scriptures that you're familiar with. But again, what I wanted to do tonight is simply seed your heart with the promises and the truth that is found in the Word of God. Notice here in chapter or Psalm 1, verse 1, what's the first word? What? Say it again. Blessed is the man or woman that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but rather his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So it goes on then to explain that he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will what? Prosper. Notice he'll be planted by uh, the rivers of water. Can you you put that up there, Julia, in the uh, ESV for me real quick? Look at this with me here. Verse 1. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of scoffers. Man, there's so much of that going on today, you guys. Just stay out of it. Next verse. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates. He thinks about, what's that mean? We're, We're thinking about the Word. We're thinking about what the Bible has to say. Okay, and then it goes on then to say in verse 3, it says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Everybody say, that's me. Yeah, that's us, praise God. That's exactly what's going to go on where our lives are concerned. And again, all I'm trying to do is put you in remembrance of what he said. Turn to Genesis chapter 12 with me, if you can find that there in your Bibles. And let's take a look at this example where Jesus, or not Jesus, but God the Father approaches a man by the name of Abram. Notice what it says here in verse 1 of chapter 12. And, and this is simply an example. I mean, in other words, what I'm trying to say to you tonight is, is that if he can do it for him, he can do it for us. Isn't that right? I mean, if, if, we'll, if we'll posture our heart and, and, and think in line with what God is declaring from, his, from the scriptures about what it is he wants to do, it can really change our attitude. It can change, uh, well, it can change everything. But it's important for us again to understand and know it. Verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, get out from your uh, country, 
from your uh, kindred, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. In other words, Abraham had to go, or Abram actually, and before his name was changed. And notice what he says, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Hallelujah. How many of you want to be a blessing? Well, he said, you know, you, you end up getting blessed to be a blessing. Notice in verse 3, and I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you, and in you will all families of the earth be blessed. Turn to chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said to him, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. So in other words, he's saying, I'm the one that will protect you, and I am the one who will give you provision. Okay? Exceeding great reward refers to that. And then they had a conversation with one another because uh, Abram at the time had, didn't have a child. And he said, you know, what can you give me? I don't have any seed. Verse 6, the Bible says, he believed in the Lord and, and God counted it to him for righteousness. Now turn to uh, chapter 17, verse 1. So when Abram was uh, uh, 90 years old and 9. So let's stop right there for a moment and let's get some perspective to this. In chapter 15, he's 75. In chapter 17, he's 99. So we've got a 24-year relationship, and a lot has gone on, okay, as they've kind of walked this thing out. And why I say that to you is, is that some people, you know, if they don't see things happen and change immediately, then they think that none of this is true. Well, God never did that for me. You know, I did this, I did that. You, you, you know, you're talking about a, a lifetime relationship. Well, not lifetime, but a, a relationship with God, a walking with God. And doing what he says, and here in verse, se- or verse 1 of chapter 17, when he was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to him and said to him, I am Almighty God. I am, in the Hebrew, it is El Shaddai, the God that is more than enough. Hallelujah. So he said, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and you and multiply your seed exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked to him. And he said, listen, I want to tell you something. It is something God is talking to this man, just like he talks to us. And he said, as for me, my covenant is with you. And I'm telling you what, the same God that said that to him said that to us in the form of sending his son Jesus to make a covenant with us. He said, as for me, my covenant is with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, so what's that look like in your life? Well, when pressure comes, when, 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 when opposition or something comes your way, you can just say, Father, praise God, I have a covenant. You made a covenant with me through the blood of Jesus for my needs to be met. And so, God, I look to you and I thank you for leading, guiding me and providing for my every need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Are you listening to me? These are the things that, that, that we need to use as, if you want to call it, weapons against the circumstances that often push themselves against us. Have any of you ever had anything pushed? Or I mean, lately, okay? I just filled my truck. It was $140, okay? You say, you got a big tank. I do. But the point is, that's a chunk of change. I mean, when you got to swipe your card twice to get it full, you know, that's a bummer. Are you with me? And all of you have experienced the same thing, you know? But I'm telling you what, praise God, he's more than enough. Can you say amen? So it goes on here, he says in verse 4, As for me, my covenant is with you, and you'll be the father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be Abram, but it shall be called Abraham, the father of nations. For a father of nations, I have made you. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and will make nations of you, and kings will come out of you. I'm going to establish my covenant, listen to this, between me and you, and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto you and your seed after you 
the land where you're a stranger, all of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I'm going to be their God. You say, well, I don't want to live in Israel. I'm telling you, you're missing the point here. The point is, is that he said that he would cause his blessing to come upon Abraham and his seed. Why is that important for you and me? Because in Galatians 3 and 19, the Bible says, if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and an heir according to God's promise. So everybody say it together. I'm in that line. Yeah, you're in that line. So when the devil, I tell you what, praise God, when he, said, when he starts coming peddling his stuff, you can say, no, devil, listen, have you not read Galatians, you know, 3 and 20? Let me read this to you. Hallelujah. You know, just help him out because he's not real good sometimes about some of this stuff. Abraham was blessed. You are blessed. Why? Because you're his seed and an heir according to the promise. You know, there's a place, and we won't take time to look at it. It's in Genesis 24 chapter. When Abraham didn't want Isaac be marrying any of the, uh, well, heathen to them or foreign women that they were surrounded by. So he sends his servant back home to pick out a, a girl for him. And um, that's where Rebecca comes into the you know, picture and everything and so on and so forth. But here's something as a matter of testament that... Uh, Abraham's servant said, when he was talking to them, he said, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord has blessed my master greatly. Who did the blessing? Who did? The Lord has, I'm telling you, God wants to bless you greatly. Hallelujah. You know? So he says, the Lord has blessed my master greatly. He's become great, and he has given him, he he, God, has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants, maid servants, camels and, and donkeys. I mean, he's got it all. Who gave it to him? Well, evidently, the Lord's not opposed to you having things. He may be opposed to you things having you, but he's not opposed to you having things. And, 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 and listen, these truths are so important. For you to understand and genuinely in your heart know and believe. Are you with me? And sometimes people's head will get in the road. You know, there's so many blessings that people could have had if they wouldn't have let their head get in the road. When we got saved and turned on to the Word of God filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean to tell you, praise God, there was such a flow of the Spirit of God. Things were happening, and it, was, and it was impacting so many people's lives. But, dude, they're wrestling with stuff. They're wrestling with religion. They're wrestling with social acceptance. They're wrestling with all the things that are in the Bible, in the New Testament, through the Gospels, in the book of Acts. You know, they regard the, and respect the men, you know, men more than they do God, and so they bail. Why? Because speaking with other tongues is not popular. Huh? It's not a socially acceptable practice, and yet it's all over in the Word of God. And rather than be rejected of so social status, they just buried it. They buried this gift. And then they just went off into the shadows and just lived a nominal Christian life. No power, no grace, no blessing, you know, of any... I mean, God will bless you as far as, as, as you will allow Him to take you. Can you say amen? So praise God, let's let him take us all the way. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So, so in this scripture, the Bible says, the Lord has uh, blessed my master greatly. And I want you to know, again, this is a simple thought, but important and very profound and powerful. And that is that poverty and lack are a curse. They're not a blessing. Are you listening to me? And thank God, because they are a curse, Christ is has redeemed you from them. Galatians 3 and 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. Why? So that the blessing of Abraham can come on the Gentiles so that you and I could receive the promise of the Spirit. Hallelujah. And enjoy the blessing of heaven. Aren't you glad tonight, praise God, that you're his child? 
and that he cares for you and wants to take care of his own. We don't have time, but you could go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And you know, in the first 14 verses, it talks about God's blessing. If you keep my commandments, this is what's going to happen. And then verses 15 through about, what, 68 or however long it is, then it talks about the curse. And that ain't cool. But, it, it, but the curse essentially, you know, is sickness, disease, poverty, and lack, and, and spiritual death and separation from God. I mean, it's a mess. So you want the blessing. Hallelujah. And you want to be in that line, not the other one. So the key for the child of God is to know and believe what it is the Bible promises and walk in the light of His Word. Now, uh, you know, as a kid, and I share my own testimony. I don't know about you. I don't know where you came from, but I know about me. But as a kid, I lived in a home that was under the curse. We didn't know we were under the curse, but we were. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I mean, before you met Jesus, did you really know that you were under a curse? No. But we didn't have anything. There was deficiency and lack all around us. You know, my dad, he died prematurely of cirrhosis of the liver because he drank himself to death. Alcohol got a hold of him and killed him. Well, that's not a blessing, you know. Jesus said, with long life, I'll satisfy you and show you my salvation. That's not long life, you know. And so I grew up in a home that was under the curse. And here's the reason why we didn't know. We were without knowledge, and essentially, we were godless. We lived just like everybody else. You guys, there's so many people in the world today, they're just living like everybody else. Oh, you know, we just do this, and we party, and we do whatever, and whatever. And they're lost, and they're blind, and they have no knowledge of the truth of God's Word and what it is that Jesus came to do for them. Are you listening to me? That's where I was. And it wasn't until I was 19 that somebody pitched the gospel to me long enough for me to get enough word on the inside of me so that I could actually make a conscious decision to recognize my need for a Savior, repent of my sin, and say, God, help me. And he did. Boom! And all of a sudden, everything's different. Now, I had to do some growing. I had to do some learning. Are you listening to me? And thank God for the Word. Everybody say, thank God for His Word. Tonight, we're talking about what the Bible says. I'm not talking about your intellect. I'm not talking about academia. I'm not talking about, you know, what you think about it. I'm, I'm talking to you about what the Bible says. And the reason is, is because you can talk yourself out of the blessing of God, or you can, you can stand, you know, erect against what it is that the Bible clearly says communicates and miss it you know a lot of people <clears throat> you know and and god warned people of this he says when you get into the land and and you obtain these houses that you didn't build and these vineyards that you didn't dress and the blessing of god begins to come on you he says he warned them he says don't forget and 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 this is how he warned them. He said, when you get there and you get real comfortable about everything that's going on around you, that you say in your heart, my might and the work of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Bad news, dude. He said, remember the Lord your God, because it is he that gives you the ability to get or obtain wealth so that he can bring to pass his promise in your life. Yes, he wants you, dude, but it's not yours to, you know, uh, you know, walk around as a trophy like you're the one that did it. He did it. Are you with me? And thank God for that. But the reason I use that, uh, I, I say that is, is that a lot of times, people in their pride, essentially, you know, they won't, they won't listen to what it is I'm telling you right now. And they'll just say, eh, yeah, well, that's all right, but I'll do it on my own. Well, do what you want, but that's not the best way. So we didn't know. You know, the good fortune that we have is, is that, thank God, my, my family all got saved. For the most part, all of them got saved. We're still working on a few, but you know how that is, you know. And they went to heaven. 
And, and, but we suffered because of what we didn't know. How many of you know that people get, end up getting destroyed? God said, my people end up being destroyed for what they don't, their lack of knowledge, what they don't know. And that's what happened to us. I mean, we're just doing our dirt. You know, we're just doing like what everybody else does. Try to, you know, scratch some kind of, you know, fulfillment or meaning or whatever out of life. And dude, it, it, it was hell. It was bad. Are you listening to me? I listened to my family arguing and fighting and, and just all kinds of drunk and messed up junk, you know, and all that. They ain't no joy and they ain't no happiness. And there is no blessing in that whatsoever. But that's all we knew, you know. And so when you see people, you know, have some compassion sometimes. You'll see them and their lives are, they're dysfunctional, they're, they're messed up, and they're just, you know, flying upside down. But, but, but remember, dude, you know, they don't know much. Matter of fact, they don't know anything, as they ought to. And so in a meekness, we should instruct those that, are in opposition to themselves so that they can get out of the snare of the devil. Can you say amen? Amen. So be cautious about that. When we got saved, when I got saved, when Joan and I got saved, she got saved first. She's smarter than me. She got saved. Now, here's a pretty young girl that grew up in a godly home and her parents were godly and everything like that, but she didn't know Jesus. Just because you grew up in a godly home don't mean nothing. Are you listening to me? It's not until you bow your, your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. You ain't getting in on mama's faith. And she was an 18-year-old girl looking and searching just like all of us were. And she discovered, praise God, her need for Christ. And it changed her life forever. Amen. So when we got saved and we got turned on to the Word of God... We ended up being married, and we, spent, we decided we were going to spend our lives serving the kingdom of God in ministry and doing the work of God all of our lives. Here we are coming up on 44 years of that, you know. <clears throat> but the thing about it is, is when we got saved, then we started hearing, we, we started learning what the Bible had to say, but there were these voices. Remember I was telling you about Jesus warning them about the, uh, the doctrine or leaven of the Pharisees? We started learning that, you know, God wanted to bless us. That God wanted our lives to be blessed. And I'm talking about in a material kind of way. And you got to understand, I didn't have none of that. So this is good news. Okay? Because I've been living under a curse. And the Bible's telling me I don't have to live that way. And that God has a plan for my life. And it's a good one. Hallelujah. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Not to harm you. To give you hope. And give you future. You know, you think people get excited about that. But I mean, even in the Christian community, they go, no, nah, that ain't what that means. That's not what that's saying. Well, dear God in heaven, what does it mean? What is it saying? And we fought it. The prosperity message, a message of faith in God to meet your needs in 1975 was not popular. Matter of fact, nobody even knew it. We're a cult. When our church started in January of 79, we were a cult. It took five years for anybody to even look at us. You know, they had all kinds of statements about us. You know, they called it the Tin Temple. They said that we were putting chickens out across the highway for people to run over. I don't know, dear God, I don't even know what they, what in the world, where in the world they come over that. Of course, you get a few beers in you and the story can really be embellished. You know what I'm saying? These people, they sit up in the bar, you know, and they get to drinking, and God only knows what it is that you're doing. And the fact of the matter is they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. Amen. So Christians opposed the message of prosperity because they thought it wasn't biblical, and then if you, if you, if you lean that way, you were being covetous. Dude, I wasn't being covetous, dude. I was just trying to live. You know, people can't pay their bills. There ain't nothing cool about it. Are you with me? And so there's balance to that. But um, uh, as far as being covenant, I guess if you want to, you can allow yourself to become that way, but you don't have to. Amen? I said amen. You know, people say, well, you just, there's too much emphasis, you know, on this whole prosperity thing. Here's what I would say to that. When there's a stronghold in your life, 
I mean, it can be anything. We don't have to talk about money, but, but if there's a stronghold in your life, when you grow up under what I grew up in, it takes several baths to get clean. Do you understand? The washing of the water of the Word of God. And so when, when the stronghold of poverty dominates, dominates your life in your thinking, it requires large, frequent doses of hearing the truth to get your ship turned around, get you, get, you, get you back up where you belong. Does that make sense to you? And people need to hear it because everything in the world is saying something different. Are you listening to me? And that's why we do need to hear it. And uh, rightly divided, and, of course. And, and uh, so, so then, you know, you finally decide, you know, I don't care what everybody else says. This is in the Bible and I'm going to believe it. And so you start down this road. Now, the next thing that you've got to uh, deal with is you've got to learn how to handle it. There has to be stewardship. Hallelujah. You've got to be good stewards, you know. Otherwise, you end up with, you know, like Haggai said, you've got a bag with holes in it. Doesn't make any difference how much you put in here. It's just, you know, until you get them, them, them holes uh, sewed up, uh, it makes it real tough. Are you with me? Am I in the right house? Okay, good. Yeah, so learn how to handle money, stewardship. And, and here's the best way to learn that. Le- the first lesson you need to learn is honor God. Put Him first where your money's concerned. Because what it does is it creates a discipline in your life, you know, and, and from there God can do a lot of other things. And uh, so like so many others, you know, I, I think back to my own life. I just fell victim to the stuff I didn't know. We've all done that, haven't we? I mean, even right now, you know, there's probably a few things that we need to learn. But, you know, it, it, it imposes so much uh, challenge upon our lives. So, um, again, God said, my people end up being destroyed for what they don't know. So the most important thing tonight is I come to this close because we're already at 09. Learn... Learn, learn, you guys, to think in line with God's Word. Okay? When it comes to the way that you judge anything, learn to think in line. You got time for one more scripture, right? Look at uh, Psalm uh, 112. Psalm 112. Again, this is territory you're familiar with. And here I thought I wasn't going to have enough notes. Hmm. Well... You know, in 40-some years, you kind of have to try to figure out maybe you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Psalm 112, look at this. Praise ye the Lord. What's the next word? What is it? Blessed. Say it one more time. Blessed. Yeah, blessed. 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 Everybody say, I am blessed. I am. You are blessed. Praise God. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord, that delights greatly in his commandments. When we fear God and we delight in his word, notice what it says in verse 2. His seed, that guy's seed, shall be mighty in the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. And his righteousness will endure forever. To the upright there arises light in the darkness. He's gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man shows favor and lends, and he will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will not be moved forever. The righteous shall be had or be in everlasting remembrance. He'll not be afraid of evil tidings, because his heart is fixed trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees his desires upon his enemies. He's dispersed abroad. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted with honor. The wicked, they'll see it and be grieved and, and shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. And the, de- the desire of the wicked shall perish. Not that long ago, we, the church gave $10,000 to the Open Door Mission. And uh, Why? Because there's all kinds of homeless people, and there's all kinds of problems, you know, where that's concerned. And Candace and her husband, I mean, it's a phenomenal thing that they're doing over there, man. I mean, it's unbelievable what that gal has done since she took charge of that place. It's good ground. 
okay? And so, you know, and, and God had put it in our heart to do it, and um, so we did it, you know? And the reason is, is because I want the blessing of God on the church. I want the blessing of God in my life. And so, praise God, we're doing what it is that he said. This is how the righteous behave. Are you with me? And so, like right now, <clears throat> you're dealing with this inflation. We all are, okay? I don't care who you are. This stuff is impacting you. Now, you may have deep pockets and all this and that and the other, but at the same time, <clears throat> it's still like a vacuum sweeper where people's lives are concerned. And so I want you to believe God with me. You know, and what, what are we believing for? Increase. You with me? You know, if you got 8.5% inflation, where's that supposed to come from? You know, we did something for our staff. I mean, this is not common knowledge, but... You know, I seen what was happening, so we just we gave bonuses to all of our staff people, you know, and said, take that, devil. You know, in other words, there's things that we can do, you know, to, to, to position ourselves uh, not to be impacted or influenced by all of this, okay? And one of the things that you don't want to do is don't stop giving, okay? And that's the first thing that happens, you know, when things get tight, then the first thing we think about, well, you know, no. That, that's when, when that comes, you say, devil, you keep talking like that, and we're going to give some extra. Are you listening to me? Because that is a, a, a funnel. It, it's a place of blessing for you as, as a human being. And, and again, I know, you know, these things are going on. But again, I want you to believe God with me. Let's believe God for our entire church, family. Everybody's, you know, being impacted by this. But wouldn't it be nice, praise God, if we would do what it is that the Lord says and keep on keeping, come, keep on keeping on and, and come through unscathed? Amen. Huh? Amen. You know? So let's stand together and we'll pray together and let's believe God together um, for this. Um, 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 let's believe Him for increase. For multiplying our seed that's being sown, for jobs, for promotions, for advancements, for opportunities. In other words, His grace upon our lives for whatever we need. Hallelujah. And so, you know, um, whatever that increase might be, praise God, He's able. How many of you believe that? All right, let's pray. Father... Tonight, as we come before you, Father God, we want to thank you together in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that you've redeemed us from the curse of poverty and lack. Glory to God. How thankful we are, Father, for what it is that you've done. So tonight we stand, Father, before you in an agreement. You said in your word that where two or more agree on earth is touching anything to ask, it'll be done of our Father which is in heaven. So, Father, we're praying for our church family those who've made this church their home, Christians, Father, at large. And we're praying, Father, for increase. We're praying for promotions. We're praying for opportunities. We're praying, Father, for your wisdom. Father God, I thank you for showing them ways where there apparently is no way. I thank you, Lord God, for causing reserves to come into their possessions so that, Father God, the needs that they have in their life will be magnificently and miraculously filled. You are the God of the miraculous, Father. And so we trust you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for meeting the needs of our church so that we can continue to be a blessing to the world that is around us. And thank you, Father God, for helping us to send missionaries all over the world to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father God, we agree together in the name of Jesus for your grace and your blessing, Father, on every house, every house, every house, every house, every house, hallelujah, within our church. And God, I thank you for your blessing tonight in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. God bless you.